Right, so as we talk about mammals, um, we'll do the same sort of thing we've done for the other groups of vertebrates. We'll talk about some adaptations, some uh, examples, and so forth. So mammals have a bunch of characteristics that we can um, look to to tell how they're similar, how they're different to other types of vertebrates. And you guys talked about some of them in our, in our question today. Um, first off, they do um, produce milk to nourish their young in mammary glands. So as we've been talking about the different groups of vertebrates, you know, fish, for example, after they hatch, they're basically on their own. They're independent from the moment of hatching. Um, same thing with amphibians mostly for reptiles. Birds need a little bit more care after hatching usually um, until they're ready to be independent. And mammals require even more. So most mammals have a period of time in which they have to be nursed by their mother um, until they grow enough, until they mature enough to be independent. So mammals have mammary glands, produce milk. They have hair or fur, at least for some point during their lifetime. And that's unique. No other group of vertebrates has, has hair. Yeah. Mammals have a four chambered heart set up in the same way that a bird heart is. Again, as we talked about with birds, that provides the maximum amount of oxygen. Oxygenated and deoxygenated blood are kept separate in the circulatory system. They breathe with a diaphragm. And so mammals have a sheet of muscle called the diaphragm that contracts and relaxes, inflating and deflating the lungs. Think about humans, our diaphragm is um, wrapped around our rib cage, and as it contracts and relaxes, we breathe in and out. Mammals have a highly developed brain as compared to the other groups of vertebrates. And they're warm-blooded. Mammals can be active in a wide variety of temperatures but at the same time they require a lot of food for energy to keep that body. Now, although most of you said something when we're talking about characteristics of mammals about laying eggs or not laying eggs, um, I kept having to make that qualification of most because there are some egg-laying mammals. Not many, but there are some. Um, and so the mammals are, so we have kingdom, animal, phylum, chordata, vertebrates, class, mammalia, mammal. And within that, there are subclasses based on their reproduction. And so one of those groups are the monotremes. These are egg-laying mammals. And there's only a few examples of egg-laying mammals, of monotremes. And one I'm sure you're familiar with, the platypus. The platypus is um, a mammal. See, it has fur and so forth, um, which is very unique, uh, native to Australia. And you know, when people first sent um, preserved specimens of a platypus back to um, Europe when they were first sort of discovered, a lot of people thought it was like a hoax, that somebody had taken parts from various animals and kind of sewed them together to form the platypus, because there's this like bill sort of thing, like a duck and webbed feet, um, but fur at the same time. Uh, and so uh, the, the platypus um, lays very, very small eggs, which hatch into very, very immature young, which then have to be nursed until they are ready to be independent for a long period of time. Here you see the young on this platypus nursing. Um, they're pretty small. And it's 
very steep tax rate. Another um, interesting fact is that uh, the platypus is the only species of venomous mammal. It has two spurs. The male platypus has two spurs near its hind limbs, uh, which are very, uh, which it has a venom, which is very painful. Um, if a person were to be um, struck by those spurs, it could be deadly to smaller mammals. Hello? No. Also, other examples: the spiny anteater, right, which you see here, is a monotreme. Another platypus. This one, just those are young platypus. I did not, I know, and missed the, the transparency in the middle. The strike here must have done that. Um, another one is the spiny end here, the echidna, which is interesting. It uh, has its milk is pink because it's very high in iron. Uh, you don't have that. This is the size of the eggs of these monotremes. So very, very tiny little eggs, you know, just a few centimeters big, which hatch into the very small young, which eventually grow and develop. Uh, there's an anteater. That's a spiny anteater. It's pretty small. Then we have the marsupial. So the monotremes lay eggs. You know anything about the reproduction of marsupials? So what's an example of a marsupial? Lucy? What's that? A koala? What else? Okay. What else? Yeah, a kangaroo. That's something that usually people say. Um, so, I mean, what do you know about the reproduction? No, that's uh, they give birth to whole babies. Whole babies, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, they give birth to whole babies <laughs> rather than like parts of babies. <laughs> not an egg, they give it to them. Yeah, so they give birth to live young, which are, again, extremely immature. Um, these young then make their way into the pouch of the marsupial, right, where the mammary glands are, and then that young marsupial nurses and stays in that pouch for a fairly long period of time, depends on the type of animal we're talking about, until it's ready to become independent. Um, so they do give birth to live young, but they're very, very small, very immature. There is one marsupial that lives in North America that lives around here, and that's the opossum. When you read this, it doesn't mean that there's only one opossum in all of North America. It means there's only one type of marsupial in North America. So that is a newborn kangaroo, about the size of a penny. It's almost just like a little tiny worm-like creature. It really only has developed front limbs. And basically after birth, that tiny little thing, all it does is it climbs into the top. It stays there for up to and over a year. Um, there you see a mother kangaroo and a joey, young kangaroo. You know, when they go through, as they get more and more mature, they start to become more independent. They'll come out of the pouch for a while and go back in until they're ready to be solely independent. How is the mother? Uh, it's just that's their adaptation and reproduction is giving birth to these tiny, tiny young. Uh, and a koala, again, is another example. Because it stays in so long, gets so large, 
that there's not room. So there's small in the beginning, but grows fairly rapidly. And that's from the bottom. They are the same. An opossum and a possum are the same. They live, you see them sometimes around here, usually sort of dead on the side of the road. Um, they're nocturnal, they live up in trees. Uh, I'll show you this video in a minute. This is a kangaroo bird. Um, but that's, again, this is a tiny little kangaroo, newborn in the pouch, nursing. Um, and it starts off and eventually, after a long period of time, it finishes its development. And then we have the large group, the placental mammals, the group of which we are a part of. And placental mammals, uh, they nourish their, their, so after fertilization, the fertilized egg is implanted in the womb, in the uterus of the female, where it grows and develops. Um, and it is attached to an organ called the placenta, that's where the name comes from. And the placenta is where materials exchange between the mother's blood and the, the embryo, and the fetus's blood. And so as the mother breathes in and gets oxygen to her blood, some of that oxygen passes into the blood for the embryo. And nutrients from what the mother eats pass to the embryo as well. And so um, it's nourished through that placenta. So the young develop internally. So they have internal fertilization and internal development. So the egg gets fertilized inside of the female's reproductive tract, and the embryo grows there until birth. This is the vast majority of mammals. 95% of mammals are placental mammals. So this diagram, we have the very early stages of development. We have the embryo, and we have the placenta. The placenta is filled with blood vessels, and it's attached to the embryo by the umbilical cord. And the umbilical cord basically contains arteries and veins which carry the blood back and forth. We look later on in development. Again, we have the placenta, which forms, it's on the wall, this is the uterus. So it forms on the wall of the uterus, okay. connected to the fetus by this umbilical. One important thing to note is that blood from the mother does not go into the fetus. So what happens is in the placenta, you have the mother's blood goes to the placenta, blood from the fetus goes to the placenta, and all the blood vessels are right next to each other. But they don't connect with each other, They're sort of right nearby, and therefore material can diffuse back and forth. Material from the mother's blood diffuses into the fetus's blood, and it goes back, at the same time, waste from the fetus is removed because it goes into the mother's blood and then her kidneys and lungs can take care of those waste products. But they're not actually connected. Are we the only placental mammals? No, 95% of mammals are placental mammals. So just about any mammal you think of, dog, a cat, a monkey, a horse, a cow, they're all placental mammals. The only exceptions are those marsupials and those monotremes. So you're like cutting them both one group? Yeah. I mean, they don't cut up, they probably gnaw through it usually. Um, yeah, or it just falls off. You don't have to cut it. Yeah, um, because after birth, after the young are born, the placenta and the umbilical cord come out as well. So the placenta detaches from the uterus wall and it comes out after the fetus comes out. All right, we're gonna, these pictures are, We'll, we'll save this um, for a few minutes. Keep your notes out. Um, I'm going to see if I can find the video to show you.